Hey guys, welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream that was usually a conversation with my friends or community day or something like that. And as usual, we have with us today, Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. <laughs> and also hello, Karen, and hello, everybody else. Happy Sunday. Yeah. Um... <laughs> We normally stream on Saturdays, but um, for y'all that keep up with my Twitter and my Discord, which is probably most of the people that are in here at the moment, uh, my internet decided to just totally biff it yesterday. It went out at like 11.15, and I was like, this is just perfect timing. Thank you, Spectrum. And it continued to go in and out for like the entire afternoon, all the way until after dinner time was it finally stabilized and stayed up for more than, you know, 30-minute chunks at a time. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, guys, for being flexible and patient with me for today's stream. We're doing it. We're doing it on Sunday instead. Um, so let's see who's here. Uh, welcome, Lunar. Welcome, Cookie. Oh, Cookie, happy to have you back. I think you're normally in the Thursday stream, so happy to see you on one of my episodes of Interstage Window. I assume you're normally busy on Saturdays. Um, welcome, Roses. I, I know you from the Discord server, but I think this is the first time I have seen you in the stream, so welcome on in. Welcome on in. Um, so yeah, I'm so happy you guys are all here today, despite my total change in plans since Spectrum decided to just like say, F you, Karen, <laughs> you thought you were streaming, but you thought wrong. Just kidding. <laughs> yep. So all that being said, um, Landon, what is it that we're talking about today? We're going to talk about something that I could talk for about for hours and hours and have, in fact, talked about it for days and years is the marauders uh, as you guys know we're doing uh, our deep dives and our media episodes on the harry potter books where we're rereading the harry potter books and discussing the impacts they have on media and everything like that and this is going to be our fandom episode and there is not much more that the harry potter fandom loves than the marauders era oh my gosh, uh, at least yeah. somebody has someone connected to it and wants to either play that character or loves that character or is in love with that character so we thought we would take a deep dive down memory lane and enjoy some fandom and <laughs> oh what a well-placed howl thank you so much for that um lunar thank you for the biddies for that howl i i uh i i i suspect um, well, I think the only other animal emote I have is goat, but I can't, don't think there's any goat animagi in Harry, Harry Potter. So we'll just have to use the howl, um, sound alert. <laughs> um, but yeah, so for those of y'all that don't know, Landon and I would not be friends if it were not for the Marauders. So we actually met in a once upon a time role play. So Disney is close to our heart, but where we truly became friends is whenever we joined a Marauders role play together while that was going on. And we decided it was time to create a ship together and we created two Death Eater characters in this Marauders era role play. And really that was that was well, just the beginning of it all. Yes. And then of course that was the beginning of our working relationship too, because you quickly took over that RP as far as Oh my gosh, thought. yeah. Yeah, <laughs> just kind of eat it out and you're like, okay, I guess I'm adminning now. Now I need a VOD team. And I was like, I'm crazy, I'll do it. Well, I don't I don't remember exactly how it went down, but I know that it when we when we realized like collectively as an RP that the admin was not coming back and I was now the only one in the role play with access to the main accounts and, and the um, applications and all of that. Um, what had to happen? I had to admin the role play if we wanted to continue and we all wanted to continue. And it was kind of like I had this moment of, well, I can't do this by myself. Oh my God. And I want to say that I sent a, it was a private message that I sent you and a couple of other people in a, in a sheer panic saying, um, I need someone to help me. Can you help me? <laughs> and luckily it was you and Shadow. And luckily both of you guys said yes. And, um, and so we actually started working together and uh, and that's where I learned that um, Landon loves to do extra stuff and will say yes to most anything. My, uh, <laughs> I, believe, uh, I believe other than making people cry will make them love you more. Uh, other than that being my tagline, it's also overcommit and under deliver. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's been around for a decade. But luckily, a, a role play group does not require a huge amount of commitment, so it was all good. <laughs> as long as I didn't eat it, like, uh, so, like the yeah, <laughs> just didn't just literally. What Landon did is she was she was there for me in my moment of need. She didn't disappear on me, and uh, and that's why our friendship 
uh, has blossomed into what it is today and why uh, Landon, really why Landon is the person that, uh, that streams with me. Yes, because I would say yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But before we start deep diving into the things that we love about the Marauders and why we could spend years writing as these characters, uh, let's talk about favorite things. Yeah. It's been, a, it's okay. been a half a second since we've done a favorite things. So, Karen, what is your favorite thing? Okay, so I have a recent obsession that I have to confess to you guys. It's one of those things that's like a brain worm that enters my mind once every um, couple of years or so, and it is making dice with resin. So I, I, I never like pull the trigger on this particular hobby. Um, I've never actually tried it. I don't know if I like it, but I know I love looking at pictures of beautiful handmade dice and watching tutorials of people making handmade dice and silicone molds and all of the other things that go into it, as well as like regular resin, like making resin shakers and things like that. So um, I once again have decided I am obsessed with the idea of potentially picking up a new hobby. And I don't know if I'll pull the trigger this time. I probably won't, but, I'll, but I might. The reason why I never end up pulling the trigger and actually committing to trying this hobby is because it would cost about $150 to $200 to kind of get started just to get like the minimum amount of equipment to make anything. Um, because I only have so much craft stuff in my house. And while I do have a decent amount of the craft stuff required, I don't have everything. Obviously, I don't have silicone itself. I don't have resin itself. I don't keep stock of like a respirator and, and gloves, which you definitely need because resin is messy as hell. So um, so you can't just like do it with your hands like you need some PPE and uh, and all of that is expensive. So <laughs> so that has been my favorite thing this past, I don't know, two weeks or so. Uh, to the point that I actually put together a wish list and, and thinking that someday I might buy this stuff and actually try it. If I do, I will show you guys, of course, I will make a YouTube video um, or stream parts of it or, or whatever so that that's the, so that it's more content. But um, but uh, yeah, I just I just love I just love the idea of it. I love the idea of a handmade dice, even though I know that means that they don't roll as well and they might like um, you know, not be not be as uh, as random as like a an actual like professionally made dice. I just love the concept of it, and I love the art of it, and it's very beautiful. In the same way that I love the concept and art of like um, having your your natural nails painted as opposed to like fake nails or things like that. So you know, it's just it's become it's become a brain worm. It's a brain worm again, and I'm spending a lot of time watching this stuff. Um, get with Madam MG. She uses resin that's fume free. Oh, interesting. I bet it's more expensive though. That would be my guess that it's more expensive than buying just resin and a respirator because the respirator is not that expensive. Like none of this stuff is that expensive by itself. It's the combination of needing so many things that adds up to the 150 to $200 mark. So it's not that any one thing is expensive. It's that all of it together to get started would be expensive, if that makes sense. I don't think it's that expensive. We're talking about dollar store girl. <laughs> well, I am definitely a dollar store girl when it comes to crafts. I'm not above going to the dollar store and getting the things that I can get um, for craft wise from the dollar store. I won't go to Michael's unless I have to, although I love, do love going to Michael's. Let's be real. Um, browsing Michael's is a wonderful experience. <laughs> so that's my favorite thing this week. I've, I've, the brain worms have happened again in regards to dice making. This is the thing I'm going to say. First of all, Lunar, I see you with needing the custom dice. Uh, mm -hmm. And the other thing is, is that Karen, it is your dream to make custom dice and it is my dream to own a pair of your custom dice. So, <laughs> <laughs> so all I'm going to say is that as your friend, I will peer pressure you into dropping that list. Um, even if it means that I have to convince you to do it over years and weeks of time. Uh, <laughs> I think that I, I am in full support of this hobby of yours. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much. I, I can, um, I can drop the, I can drop the list. No pressure for anybody, but I will link it to you guys so you can kind of see what I'm working with and what kind of I still need in the house and, and kind of what I don't need, you know? Um, so I, let me grab that really quick for you guys so that you can kind of see what I'm working with and what I'm thinking about that I still need. Um, there we go. We are always up to new, no good, Scrub Lord. Always. <laughs> especially right now. Especially right now. Um, okay, so that, that is my favorite thing this week. 
Well, let's do slides, not disclaimer yet. Okay, that is my favorite thing this week. So Landon, what is your favorite thing this week? Uh, my favorite thing this week, and it's not necessarily this week in general. Um, it's been over the last few weeks. I think it's been like a month since we did favorite things. Uh, yeah. Halloween and, and hiatuses. But I uh, have really, really started playing a lot of D&D uh, in the last couple of weeks. Um, either like with students just having fun little writing exercises using D&D stuff. And also I found a group that I've been playing with once a week. That's been a lot of fun. Uh, and just a lot of a lot of D&D happening. And as I sink into this obsession more and more, uh, the more I realize that I, I love it and I wish I had gotten into it during high school because even though I love role play, this also tickles a, a different kind of spot in the back of my brain. <laughs> so. I love it. I love watching like my text based role play friends get into tabletop and then like vice versa, my tabletop friends getting into text based role play because they're they are like they're like they're like parallel, right? Like they yeah. they're like very they're very similar. And I think once you once you get into one and you figure out how to do one very well, you can transition a lot of those skills over to the other. And it makes you a very strong player of either way. Welcome in Kay. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, and welcome Scrub, by the way. I didn't say that vocally. I just typed it because Landon was talking, but welcome into you guys. So I'm, I'm so happy that you're enjoying D&D uh, &D, Landon. And um, and I hope that we can we can branch out after you've gotten kind of comfortable with D&D. &D. And, and this is to some of my other friends that are getting new into D&D &D as well, that we can branch out into maybe some other tabletop games that are a little bit more different, a little bit more out there, you know, because um, I think you guys would have a lot of fun with some different systems too have some fun yes i mean it just is it's just a lot of fun pretending to be somebody else oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah that's been that's been my favorite thing over the last couple of weeks so some new hobbies it seems fall is the time for hobbies uh this you know sun is slowly going away and uh we are starting to enjoy things that are happening both indoors and also that sometimes happen in a deep dark basement so we don't have to <laughs> <laughs> the true introverts we are um, it's not really D, D if you're not playing like in your basement or garage or like spare room or something like that right yeah no yeah. it's it's not unless you like unless you like i think it's more of the immersive part of it if you're scared a goblin will come out of the deep deep dark crevices of whatever room you're in mm -hmm. uh it's more immersive that way that you're like, I could be attacked at any point in time. Absolutely. That's, that's what really makes it interesting. Yes, I totally agree. <laughs> um, uh, by the way, if anybody wants baby cam for this stream, Lady is sleeping on the bed. So if anybody wants that, just do the baby cam. Um, also, we have a community uh, challenge going on right now for your spell reagents. If you um, get all that filled up, then after I finish Final Fantasy X on Artistic License, I will do the rest of Doki Doki Literature Club, which I thought I had reached the end of when I did my blind stream. I was wrong. So if you want to see the rest of that, it gets even more bonkers and crazy and scary. Um, and I will be happy to play it for you guys if uh, if we reach that community goal. So FYI, don't forget on that. Oh, there we go, Lunar. Good. Yeah, 4,000. Awesome. Um, okay, so all of that said, I suppose we can actually we can actually uh, start the, the for real topic now. So how do we want to get started, Landon? Uh, let's talk about, let's just get a quick introduction into the Marauders. For those of mm -hmm. you who may not know um, and, and have not engage with this just wonderful side of the Harry Potter fandom. Or it's been uh, forever for you, which I'm sure is a lot of forever. people. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it is, so the Marauders is based off of the group of four friends that Harry discovers makes the Marauders map, uh, which is a map that he receives in his third year of Hogwarts and the Prisoner of Azkaban that tracks all of the people in all of Hogwarts to show you exactly where you are, including secret passageways so that you can get out of the castle secretly, uh, hidden storage rooms so that you can hide from, uh, from Filch and Peeves and other professors, and uh, really acts as like a good way for Harry to stay out of trouble throughout the rest of the book series. Uh, and also, you know, give him indulgence into his own stalkerish type tendencies that he seems to have. <laughs> Over several people. Anyway, that's not the point. <laughs> um, as we learn more in the third book, the more we learn about uh, the past that Harry's parents had at Hogwarts. So we discover that the Marauders are actually uh, James Potter, 
Sirius Black, Remus Lupin, and Peter Pettigrew. Four best friends and four of the brightest young men to ever come to Hogwarts, especially because they did a lot of shenanigans in their time. And all of them grew up to then fight into the war, uh, fighting the war to fight uh, Voldemort, except some of them then double-crossed their friends and joined them. And so we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive on each character and then also talk about like how fandom views them. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. so, the truth is, even though they're a big shadow over Harry, they're, we don't get a huge amount of them in canon. Um, we get how they relate to Harry, but how they relate to each other is uh, left a lot there's left a lot of speculation so the fandom of course has latched right onto that but i would also like to say um as always during our harry potter themed streams we do not support uh jk rowling's bigotry um and and we're not interested in uh, in platforming that or anything like that so as always we recommend for these streams if you would like to give me bits if you would like to subscribe instead please take that money and give a donation to the Trevor project that would be much preferred for these streams um, to try to give back a little bit to the people that JK Rowling is actively hurting with her presence on Twitter. Yes. Uh, yeah. Fuck turfs. Mm-hmm. Fuck turfs. <laughs> the, the best way to say that. But, yep. Um, and also, like, if we really want to just, like, fuck turfs and fuck uh, JKR's, like, hate for queer people let's start with the most queer of them all um which is Remus Lupin (laughs) yes okay so can't say that Sirius Black is queer in his own right too (laughs) yeah but Remus Lupin is super queer so here's here's what's up with that so there's a lot of stuff that people people will say things like oh um Remus Lupin uh JK Rowling always imagined him as gay well that's not necessarily true here's here's the real story Landon did some fact checking to make sure um what we were what we knew about the remus lupin being gay thing so remus being gay was something that the director of the movie communicated to the actor it was not something that was ever written into the books there's no evidence that jk rowling came up with it as far as the evidence goes it was something that the director was interested in exploring with Remus Lupin. And as we know, J.K. Rowling loves to editorialize and, and rewrite and uh, and redo things in Harry Potter. So you can find evidence after that that she was interested in the idea, but there's no evidence before that. So what that means is that Remus Lupin's queerness is um it's it's largely a a fandom interpretation it is not necessarily an original interpretation um isn't he bi he has supposedly female partner in the last movie that's true but wolf star is not canon i know it feels canon but it's not Um, canonically remus lupin is straight is what jk rowling um pushed for although by the time like when they were filming the third one the last book where he did get married and the sixth book where he started a romantic relationship hadn't been published yeah um so there wasn't proof that remus lupin was anything but up for interpretation because Mm -hmm. he hadn't had any canonical uh, romance partners yeah and it wasn't until the sixth book and then the seventh book that he that he was written in a love story with a woman yes Mm mm-hmm Yep. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about, um, about Remus Lupin. So maybe we can like alternate these, like I'll take Remus and then you can take the next one and we'll do that. So, so yeah. here's the history of, of Remus Lupin. At three years old, he was bitten by the werewolf Fenrir Greyback. And this is when he contracted the disease that, um, that turns wizards and humans into werewolves that's how it works in harry potter the, to become a werewolf you are you are bitten typically right and this is because remus lupin's father declined an invitation to help with the resurgence of grindelwald's power back during the time that grindelwald was building up his his power right so this was kind of like fuck you mr lupin i'm gonna turn your son into a werewolf that's what you get for naming him moon moon and so <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's the history that we have of Remus Lupin. That's like his early life and how he contracts the werewolfism. 
Um, and then he's a wizard, though, of course, still. He's still a part of a magical family. So it is presumed in canon that his his family kind of helps him manage his, his werewolf-ism. And then eventually he gets invited to Hogwarts. And that is where he meets Sirius and James and Peter. And it's not explained exactly how this happens in canon, but basically he bonds with them. They become friends. They figure out his secret that he is, he's secretly a werewolf and that he has to, yeah, sorry, go ahead. He has a furry little problem. Uh, a little furry little problem. problem. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So they have to, so they then decide to help him. Um, because what had been set up when he when he went to Hogwarts is that um, that Dumbledore and uh, and I can't remember who the who the master was at, at the time the, the headmaster was it Dumbledore during that time or was it the previous guy I can't remember there's there's a time where it's yeah there's a time where it switches over but anyway um, Dumbledore and and some of the other professors had helped Remus with with his with his furry little problem by uh, by having every full moon him go out to the shrieking shack where he was like away from the students and it was all good he'd go do his werewolf thing out there and then in the morning he could come back and um, so eventually his friends Cirrus James and Peter figure this out and uh, and they decide to help him by all learning at the ripe age of 12, I think it is, how to become uh, animaguses. Yes, they start they start learning the process of becoming an animagi, uh, but are not successful until fifth year, which means yeah. they, they were 15. So a little bit more realistic. <laughs> I had forgotten that detail. I knew that they <laughs> learned he was a werewolf and were trying to help him basically the whole time. So I was thinking it was second year, but they must have started in second year and then finally mastered it by fifth year. Which is insanity <laughs> just, mm-hmm. just like remus dying out. was literally a personal attack i agree k i agree oh yeah no. i love remus i'm definitely a remus stan i'm i'm one of those um lupin fans in the sense of like i'm not hardcore wolf star i'm not hardcore remadora i really don't care about ship wars if it's got remus x anybody i will read it remus x nymphadora i'll read it remus x james i'll read it remus x Sirius, i'll read it any 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 i'm good with any any and all for remus lupin he deserves all the love he does deserve all the love i cannot (laughs) i cannot do remus and james but that's fine (laughs) if you ship it it's okay i get it i just can't do Mm -hmm. it (laughs) Uh, but yes no remus is the best and i think the most well-developed marauder because we also see him the most we have an entire year of him doing what he should have been doing the entire time which is helping harry discover himself Mm -hmm. um and and so we get to know him the best which makes him the most likable marauder Mm -hmm. he really is and um and wise and kind yeah i agree wise and kind absolutely fits remus's character he he does um so yeah so that's that's his childhood and that's basically the background that we get of Remus. And as far as canon material goes, that's really all we know up until, of course, in the third book when we actually meet him and uh, we learn a little bit about what's going on in his present day. So, um, so Landon, I've talk- been talking for a lot. Um, so what, what is Remus in, in present day and well, present day canon? So I guess in, in 1990, uh, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, so we, we learn, this is the first time, of course, werewolves are really mentioned um, in the series. So we learn about anti-werewolf legislation that has been happening, and that kind of leaves us to believe as well as how Remus Lupin is introduced, the fact that he doesn't have great clothing, the fact that he looks really rumpled, that he's exhausted, all of these things. It really leads uh, us to believe that there has been a long life of Remus Lupin being very poor, destitute, alienated from the wizarding world because of his werewolf, uh, because he has had to like register as a werewolf, um, unable to keep a job, that he's really been down on his luck this entire time and like barely making it through and in, in, in severe poverty. So that's okay. kind of where we're introduced with uh, Remus, but we're also learning that he is incredibly empathetic, very wise, the best teacher that Harry has at Hogwarts, um, that he is capable of great feats of magic. Uh, and that he really is a good person, despite the fact that he is this terrible monster um, in the books. 
Yeah. Uh, so it really shows like the Jekyll and Hyde of it all. And that's kind of how he's presented, which is, again, we talked about this last time. We hate it. It's terrible. Um, but that's kind of what we're presented with. Yeah, if you want to hear like our takes on how werewolves are in general in Harry Potter, go on my YouTube channel and find the VOD for um, the third book. We have uh, in the in the um, uh, Spot the Problems section, we talk a lot about werewolves in general and uh, and how we do not believe the the whole like it's an allegory for being gay. I don't think that was intended because if it was, yikes. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't get past publishing um mm -hmm. yes no and then uh and then we're introduced to him in hogwarts and in hogwarts he seems as a teacher he seems really happy he actually has a place to live he doesn't have to worry for his job and then it isn't until the end of the book when severus snape accidentally lets like leaks to the student that he is a werewolf uh and because of this uh, parents start writing and saying that how dare you have a werewolf teach our children this is unsafe and um and now he is then left jobless mm -hmm. and once again poor and destitute and harry is once again abandoned yeah. uh and this is kind of the theme until the war starts up again and and uh suddenly uh his werewolf features and is useful especially to Dumbledore where he can act as a spy he acts as a spy for most of the sixth book and uh, some of the fifth book and uh in the end dies in the seventh yeah very tragic <laughs> uh, it's very as a, tragic as a metaphor for uh to leave uh yeah accidentally Kendra uh, as a metaphor for Teddy, his young son, to be left an orphan so that we understand that war kills people. Yeah. Uh, and that is his story arc. Yeah. So really a miserable and sad life for Remus Lupin because he survives the longest of all of his friends and he is left to live a lonely, destitute and alienated life because of his genetic makeup and an illness that he received as a punishment for his father refusing to be a blood supremacist. Mm -hmm. Yep. Ah! <laughs> it is, his story is absolutely tragic. And, um, and, and that is why that, I mean, that's why so many people are drawn to him because you, what you do learn about him is just so sad and i think fandom loves to take a sad boy and try to make it better um you know if people say things like well i don't want to i don't want to read a story like if you get writing advice like nobody wants to read a story where only good things happen to characters it's very boring and that's very true but you know when people do like to read it when it's when it's a fanfic of a character that got no happiness in canon then they do oh. want to read like thousands and thousands of words of nothing happening <laughs> well, do you want to know what they love to read even more they love to read in excruciating detail all of these sad things happening. That's and exactly true. what Remus Lupin was thinking as his best friend, one of his best friend dies, the person that he supposedly and is romantically in love with kills the other best friend and then goes off to jail forever within the span of 48 hours. Uh, he, like, I love this. <laughs> Thank you, Kendra. Into the memory of Remus Lupin. Thank you, Kendra, for that applause. That's first applause of the stream. So now Landa can live another week. Thank you so much. <laughs> much, much necessary. <laughs> yep. So, so that's Remus Lupin in canon. And he is the most that we get of any of the Marauders in canon, which, which is great. Um, we love him for it. But of course, there because it, we, we only get his childhood as explained in some flashbacks or as explained by him, right? Which of course you're you're not typically a reliable narrator on your own story. Uh, what that means is that the the fandom's got some Remus takes too. So so uh, so Landon, what is your favorite fandom Remus Lupin take? So this isn't even my favorite, but this is a little worm that has been put in my head by TikTok about a month and a half ago that has not left uh it, it like will not leave and that is this idea that i had grown up with the idea that remus really got along with lily they're very similar very smart academically focused they both have a, a higher moral compass 
than both than their counterparts, all of that, uh, and that they liked each other. But then someone pointed out that Remus Lupin never talks about Lily at all in canon. He doesn't mention, like, he says, I'm a friend of your father's. Mm -hmm. He talks about, like, James at school. He only mentions Lily in relation to James liking her. Like, he never actually mentions Lily. And it is now my favorite headcanon to just think that, that Remus hated Lily. Like, just, yeah. just really didn't like her for the purpose of, like, being like, oh, yeah, I'll put up with you because you're my best friend's spouse. But we're always competing for the same stuff. And not, we don't get along, <laughs> which I feel is very realistic. It is. And I think it's so funny, these other takes, because when I think of like, you know, the question of does Remus get along with Lily, I think about kind of their their golden trio counterparts, right? Like Hermione is is Remus's counter. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, no, Hermione is Remus's counterpart. And then um, for Lily, it's Jenny. And we see yeah. um, we see Jenny and Hermione getting along in canon. So that kind of like lends to the idea that uh, that Remus and Lily probably got along. Why wouldn't they? But um, but you're right. When you actually look at the canon material, there is more evidence that they did not get along because that's literally like Remus literally never mentions her. He has he has takes and opinions and comments on every single one of his other friends. Right. He has comments about Sirius, about Peter, about James. He even has comments about Snape, but he never, ever comments on Lily as her own person. And it just makes me laugh at the idea that he is, he can tolerate talking about Snape, a man he literally almost killed and then at some point, like, ruins his life by revealing he is a werewolf. He can talk about Snape, but he can't talk about Lily because I believe uh, Remus Lupin was like, ah, Lily is dead. There is a rule that you cannot speak ill of the dead. So I will not say anything. <laughs> and nice boy Remus would so follow that. He would so be like, that bitch was annoying, but I must never speak it because she's gone now. And like, it's not necessary. She's not here. So I'm just going to keep my wolfy mouth shut. <laughs> they like, this is, this is his mother. I can't give him a negative opinion on her, even if she was a very annoying person. <laughs> But it's so funny. It's so funny because you know, you know. Oh, thank you so much for the howl, Lunar. I think that was another Lunar howl. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, yes, absolutely. I just think like, it's just so funny to me because you know, Lily was hanging out with all the Marauders. Like they were doing things, the five of them. You know I, this. There's no way they weren't. Here. Oh, yeah. Yes. They had study groups together. They were going to Hogsmeade together. They were eating in the Great Hall together. Like obviously so there's no way remus did not get to know lily and form some kind of bond with her so the idea that this bond is pure and utter annoyance it just it just it, it's just beautiful the idea is beautiful it's it is my favorite and it is so good and i i just i love it it's it brings me much joy mm -hmm. so that was that was my favorite it's I, in my fan fiction, tend to like the idea of all of them liking each other more. But again, this is a worm that has dug its way into like the center of my brain and been like, yes. Yeah. But the, but the idea that they didn't really get along that well is so appealing because it really speaks to the whole like, okay, the Marauders are, are very similar to the Golden Trio and how they relate. Like we talked about that on the Azkaban stream, but the Marauders didn't do everything right like right like they didn't support peter the way they should have the way that the the golden trio eventually starts supporting neville properly right like they didn't let snape just be a weirdo and, and be himself and still be friends with him the way that the golden trio lets um lets uh luna lovegood still like be a weirdo and be herself right so this idea that there's these weird annoyances and rivalries where they, they just hang out because of proximity and not necessarily because they truly enjoy each other's company um really does it really does suit everything that happens in the series very very well <laughs> it really does yep um, um and of course my so so um the other the other uh, fandom thing in regards to in regards to Lupin that I think is so big is of course Wolfstar right and we're okay. gonna talk more about Wolfstar whenever we get to um, to Sirius. However, I just have to say, 
I am so here for pansexual Remus Lupin. Like, give me all the pansexual Remus Lupin. I freaking love it. Um, I'm here for it. I think that Wolfstar was real, okay? And and Remadora was real. And and I think that um, that Remus Lupin, probably while he was poor and destitute, survived off of sugar daddies and sugar mamas um, when he wasn't working. Like, I'm just, I just love this. Sex worker Remus Lupin, come on. Absolutely, yes, 100%. Welcome into the stream, Jed. You've joined at a wonderful time. Um, yes, we talked all about the uh, the HIV and how that related to lycanthropy in our um, Prisoner of Azkaban stream. You can find that VOD on my channel. So we're kind of talking about Remus Lupin in the fandom at the moment. I ship yeah. Luna and Neville so hard. Me too. It's a it's a it's so wrong that Luna went and married Newt Scamander. She should have married Neville. Agreed. It's so wrong that they changed it in the movies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's the one, and it's one of the changes I'm perfectly content with. Uh-huh, same. <laughs> so yeah, um, I mean, I'm I'm here for it. Pansexual Remus Lupin, sex worker Remus Lupin. Um, that that is my that is my favorite. And it's not like as wide as the whole like uh, Remus Lupin hates Lily, and it's it's not as wide as Remus being Wolf Star. Like that's probably the most popular fandom take is to ignore uh, Remadora and to just focus on Wolf Star. <laughs> yeah, which, I mean, and we're gonna I we can talk about Wolf Star right now. Um, Wolf Star is a huge huge part of the Harry Potter camp fandom. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I think it is the number one ship on like number one Harry Potter ship on Ao3 mm -hmm. and on Fanfiction.net. Um, there's a huge, a huge amount of content for Wolfstar, which is great. But what that really led to in the fanon, or in fandom, is the shipping wars, and yeah. um, and especially on Tumblr, it got really, really toxic, and people got really possessive over their ships to the point of like death threats if you ship shipped Remadora. Um, just like really possessive over their ideas of who Remus Lupin is which is really hard because the majority of what people love about him is just fanon ideas it's not mm -hmm. even really canon yeah. um and that caused a lot of turmoil and, and turbulation within the fandom and a lot of toxicity yeah like aunties weren't really fully a thing quite yet at this time. The radical feminist ideas hadn't fully seeped into fandom. But when you talk about as bad as shipping wars got, um, fighting over Wolfstar versus Remadora was probably the first time that I saw ship wars go too far on the regular. And yeah. they did. They absolutely did. And it was it wasn't it wasn't quite like aunties, right? Like it wasn't quite the um the anti-kink rad femme stuff that you see in today's fandom shipping wars, but it had like some echoes of that. There was definitely people that told people that preferred Rima Dora, that they were being um, queer phobic yeah. and um, and that they the only reason they liked Rima Dora is because they hated gay people. And, and that meant they were worthy of death threats. And um, and then on the other side, there was uh, there was definitely Rima Dora fans that I saw that would hate on Wolfstar fans and basically tell them that they deserve the death threats because they refused to accept what was obviously canon. Um, and, and that's why, you know, they deserved it. And, uh, it was, it got vicious. It got vicious. Like, I can't remember another ship that was like pre anti times that I saw get like that. Yeah, it was, there were, there were things scary about it. Also, like, I remember when we were searching for like RPs, it was written in the rules. Like, even if they didn't have a Rima Sloopin currently being played, I remember specifically two different RPs having it in their rules of Remus, Remus and Sirius have to be together. Mm -hmm. um, and that could be because an admin was playing Sirius and that's what they were specifically looking for in their Remus. Um, but the fact that that's in the, the RP rules just goes to show how much this fandom cared about this. Yeah. And sometimes nobody, I would see RPs at that time where um, nobody was playing Remus or Sirius. Yeah. And yet they would have in the rules whether the RP was like Wolf Star or non Wolf Star. Yeah. Or can And then like they would also like not say even Wolf Star. They, they would be Wolf Star or Canon. Yeah. Um, canon was code word for not Wolf Star. Yeah. Canon, uh, canon meant you can't make gay Remus. 
you can't bring Wolfstar into this RP. And and I know why people would do that. They would do that because like people that were hardcore into shipping Remus a specific way, I'm sorry, they were just annoying as fuck. I'm sorry. Like I was there and they were annoying as hell. Um people that were hardcore into Wolfstar would would very frequently get um very em- emotional about if Wolfstar wasn't going to happen in the RP they were in even if they weren't playing Remus or Sirius and vice versa happened too people that were very anti Wolfstar would um would would join RPs and if Wolfstar was happening be really fucking annoying about it um and and this went on for years it went on for years so i can sympathize sometimes with um admin specifying up front whether they were wolfstar versus canon uh but man it read really weird when you were reading the rules and it's like oh this one ship you have to do it this way but nowhere uh, no other place do they say like they don't say you have to jilly they don't say that Not but say they would that. say you have to wolfstar it was and weird it, no it was it was really weird and it was it it, it was deeply and oddly personal to a lot mm-hmm. of people uh and again part of that pre-anti moving into the anti-movement um or anti's movement so it just it it caused a lot of drama it caused a lot of backlash it caused like a great divergence in the harry potter series like people really stopped engaging in fandom because of how toxic it can get yeah i know some people that stopped too because they they had a preference as far as remus went and they just couldn't handle reading all that stuff yeah and i i had a very close friend that was like very much anti uh, or not anti, but just did not believe in Wolfstar and would get death threats because of it. Mm-hmm. And it was like, okay. Because she would post Remadora. She would post right. Remadora and they would come for her, even though she wasn't posting any anti Wolfstar stuff. She was just posting Remadora and they would come for her. It, yeah. it got that bad. Like it was ridiculous. No, it was, it was just an interesting time. And that I think is the t- most toxic the, the fandom ever got around yeah that's for my experiences yeah that's the most toxic i ever saw um like yeah it was it was the the absolute most toxic that toxicity has died down now most people have like grown to either accept it or move on (laughs) Mm -hmm. like well i think a lot of people have moved on um by because basically because jk rowling's kind of ruined harry potter for them um and her stupid tweeting so uh so yeah i think actually the fandom is quite chill and cool at the moment (laughs) unfortunately for unfortunate reasons right like yeah okay um i actually think the harry potter fandom is is really nice right now um for for for, (laughs) yeah for sad reasons but uh but it's true (laughs) um but no i think that that is a huge that's a huge just part of it and that was Mm -hmm. it was a very interesting time in the fandom and it, it just goes to show how like important these characters are to people in the fandom that they would get so possessive over them. Yes. Uh, oh my like, god, yeah. Like don't get me wrong, there was possessive over a lot of different kinds of varieties of characters, but the the marauders and the NPC or the the PCs that people made up. So like Marlene McKinnon, uh Emily Van uh, Emily Vance um Bertha Jorkins yeah yes um those characters called to a lot of people and a lot of people had opinions about them and it was very and that like you can see because that's where the toxicity was that's where most of the fighting was a lot of people existed in that era Mm -hmm. um and it was at one point in time really hard to find an RP that wasn't based in Marauder's time (laughs) (laughs) Which was fine uh, with me. Marauders was my preference because I I felt like I had more yeah, freedom. I but it. there were certain times that it was hard to find a good Marauders RP because the admins would restrict my freedom. Like the whole reason I want Marauders is because I don't want cannon hanging over my head, you know. Exactly. So yeah. Um. So that is that is our wonderful Remus Lupin. And since we're talking about Remus Lupin and we talked about Wolf Stars, perhaps we should move into the second half of uh, that ship. Okay. Here we go. Talk about Sirius the drama Black. queen himself, uh, <laughs> the the ultimate drama queen, Sirius Black. Mm-hmm. Um, and man, oh man, oh man, should I do his history and you can do it? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, tell us, tell us all, tell us about Sirius Black. What do we know in canon about Sirius Black's history? So Sirius Black is the eldest Black heir and son of the Black family. He uh, he is the only 
he is the oldest boy of that generation. Um, so a lot of pressure was put onto him to inherit and uphold the Black family beliefs, which aligned obviously with pure blood and wizard and, and wizard first and anti-muggle sentiment. Uh, so he grew up in that family line of thinking and rebelled against it. He, from a very young age, was like, this is fucking stupid. I am going to hang up pictures of motorcycles and muggles and muggle women, and you can't tell me what to do. Uh, and he- An he inspiration, of, truly. <laughs> truly. He had that sort of fuck you mentality with it, but because he was the heir, uh, I think that his family put up with it for a very long time. Uh, and so he went to he went to uh, Hogwarts, and I think probably made made friends with uh, the first ragtag group of kids that would piss his family off, uh, which would be the Blood Trader Potter, the Werewolf Remus Lupin, and uh, Half Blood Peter Pettigrew, and was like, "This is my people now," uh, <laughs> and basically formed a friendship with all of them at Hogwarts. Remus, or not Remus, Sirius uh, was known for being a troublemaker. Him and James were constantly in detention. I do believe that when Harry has to go back and like rewrite all of the detention slips from that era, there was like a year where they had like over a hundred and hundred like detentions in one year or something like that. <laughs> Which would mean that like most of their time was spent in detention. They didn't need no study hall because they just had detention. They could just study together in there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And also, not only did they not need study hall, but but Sirius Black was like a genius without even trying. He didn't he didn't care about school. He didn't care about grades. I don't think he even cared much about what he was going to do after. There's nothing, at least in the text, that points to that. Um, he had no real ambition. His only ambition was to like like basically raise a middle finger to the society that he came from mm -hmm. and uh he could be a genius without trying he easily engaged in the animagi spell he created the marauders map he was able to ace all of his classes and tests uh he was one of the brightest boys of the age even with this no care sort of mentality of not even bothering to study whereas like remus lupin studied very hard for things he was a quidditch player um, but he wasn't like passionate about Quidditch. He just kind of did it because it was fun and James was doing it. Um, he, he played a, uh, oh my God, bludger, beater. He played a beater mm -hmm. on the G Gryffindor Quidditch team. Um, and that's really what we know about his, like canonly what we know about of his time at Hogwarts. That and he was also a bully. He hated Snape and almost killed him. Um, so he also has, was very bad with like, knowing his limits and knowing what is okay and not like that's just kind of his personality of of extreme he's willing to do anything to extremes mm -hmm. um he is i'm sure there was a lot of projection there like i think i think oh, that yeah. probably from from sirius's viewpoint um everything that he that he did was really just was literally like what would my parents hate like i think i think his parents probably assumed that well if you know he's like this but when he gets to hogwarts he'll get into slytherin because he's a black and they'll straighten his slytherin friends will straighten him out and it'll be all good well he gets to hogwarts and obviously that's not what happens and um and so yeah i i agree pretty much everything that he does during hogwarts as far as canon oh. that we know is motivated just by a middle to middle finger to his parents and then we have to mention this part sorry this was not in the notes um, but upon continuously doing the middle finger to his parents uh, in the end of their fifth year, uh, going into sixth year, uh, Sirius and his mother got into a huge fight uh, that resulted oh, yeah. in Sirius being blown off the tapestry of the Black family, disinherited uh, and kicked out of the house where he then went to the Potter's house and lived there for the rest of his Hogwarts career and I'd assume post Hogwarts up until everything happened yeah yeah up until he was able to get his house back so I would he did eventually at at one point his family did give up on that idea of he will eventually grow out of this behavior and that's when they started focusing on his younger brother the only other male uh that the only other male black that could inherit the like family title and all of that uh which was Regulus mm -hmm. and it was the only sibling that Sirius had yeah, poor Regulus. That's another like sad, sad character. Um, Talk about Regulus all the time. Yes, Regulus is so tragic. He's so tragic. 
Well, because I think, I mean, he's probably scared because we because we learned it was just a little aside about Regulus because I think it's really fascinating. Um, we learned that he basically feels the same way Sirius does, only he got sorted into Slytherin. So he still has a lot of that pure blood influence around him. And um, and seeing what happened to Sirius, I'm sure it scared, scared his pants off. Like, he was probably, like, terrified. Like, I don't want that to happen to me. So I have to pretend like I believe in this pure blood stuff, even though I don't. Um, so, yeah, absolutely tragic. Welcome in, Brenny. Welcome in. Um, so, it, by the way, anybody that's, uh, that's just joining now, if you have points to spend, we have a community challenge going on, so check that out. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think, when I think of Regulus, I just think of, like, it, him being so, so scared and so bullied by his family and his parents, and so, them being so unwilling to let him express himself, um, and, and instead of reacting of, like, you know, turning it up to 11 the way Sirius does, he, he reacts as, like, retreating into himself and trying his best to keep his nose down and um and do what he can to just survive and pretend yeah it's, so it's sad. very it's very much implied that both regulus and Sirius came from a very abusive household both yeah. physically and emotionally and mm -hmm. probably verbally knowing the family members yeah i don't see how it couldn't there. also be verbal it like at least <laughs> verbally you know um, a lot of ver a lot all three kinds of abuses uh mm -hmm. he suffered from and typically if you are a child of abuse there are two ways that you act out uh, you either completely raise your middle finger to that family and are able to do it that way, or you try to play within the lines of the abuse, the abuser's expectations. Uh, and it is very common for two siblings to have different reactions, mm -hmm. especially given birth order. Yeah, um, absolutely. So it, it makes sense. And it's basically two sides of the same coin uh, and two different paths of how to handle abuse. You see that within the Black Brothers. Mm -hmm. and both obviously have tragic endings yeah really sad so when we meet Sirius finally in canon um essentially what has what has happened to him is he's been in Azkaban this whole time um but he is not actually guilty of killing James and Lily we find out that um that is that is something that uh that Peter told on and, uh, and Voldemort went and killed them that way. It was not Sirius that had uh, spilled the beans and um, and told on them and, and caused their death. So, um, well, so it should have been Peter and Azkaban this whole time. And Sirius, this just really goes to show like how Sirius's character, it's really all about him being incredibly emotionally strong-willed. And that's why I think of him a lot as, uh, as Ron's counterpart. Ron is also very emotionally strong-willed. Is he was able to not go insane in Azkaban simply from holding the belief that he is not guilty and one day he's going to escape and prove it and like that that entire the willpower of that the spite of that fuels Sirius Black the the man is fueled by spite spite and somehow he doesn't go crazy from Dementors purely from that belief he holds in his heart when I say that Sirius Black is the most dramatic character ever and completely queer coded for that reason. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I mean that this is the man that hid behind a door and waited until everyone was in the room to shut it and be like, I'm actually innocent. Like, it's insanity. <laughs> yeah, that's that's like that's it that's like the whole thing like that's, he somehow survives for years and years and years yeah. not going crazy as the dementors right. suck joy out of him because the the core of his emotional resonance is nothing to do with happy thoughts it has to do with spite <laughs> with i am gonna fucking get this rat and i will prove to people that yep. i am right <laughs> yep yep <laughs> Fight. And you yep. know that he was sassing the Dementors the entire time. And that's what led to Bellatrix Lestrange's uh, going insane. It's not because of anything else. It is because Sirius Black kept making really witty quips from across the, <laughs> from across the hallway. <laughs> I mean, I kind of sympathize for Bellatrix in that situation. Would you not also just go batshit if you didn't have to listen to just Dementors, but also this clown 24-7? <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh yeah no that was a real moment for for uh remus lupin to finally understand that like oh shit peter peter is alive peter was responsible the man that i thought was guilty for 12 years not only was not guilty but sat in azkaban going insane when i could have been doing something oh the amount of guilt remus lupin had 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <sighs> but but you know, serious. He's strong. He's strong willed. He's he's strong emotionally, and so I don't believe that he faults Remus for any of that. There's no evidence in canon that he has any animosity towards Remus. Um, you know, he's he's willing to be patient and uh, and and let Remus work through his guilt and and be his friend is it quickly again. I think that's very true, um, which is 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 a huge huge driver of uh, of Wolfstar. By the way, like the idea of Wolfstar getting back together after uh, the third book, after Prisoner of Azkaban, is um, is of course very very popular in the fandom, and I think it's it's fueled mostly by Sirius's attitude towards um, towards uh, Remus and the fact that oh you know Remus, if I was in your shoes, I'd have thought the same thing. So it's all cool. I don't care. I still love you. Oh yeah, but Remus being the, you know, trained to hate himself from a young age because he is what he is, hates himself for this too. You know what? Just, oh, oh my tragic. god, the angst. The Lay angst. tragic. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yes, do we want to talk about some fun fandom takes? Yes, okay. So there's really not a huge amount of evidence for this in canon, but um but what when when we learn of remus as like being really into quote unquote muggle stuff right like he has the motorcycle um he has the the posters of the the hot girls he's um he's interested in muggle sports and things like that um it kind of paints this picture of like he's like this this hotty toddy like playboy bad boy kind of situation and there really isn't a huge amount of evidence for that in canon in in canon you could more read it as he's just as much of a stupid nerd as the rest of these guys um he just happens to be okay at school and okay at quidditch but um but the fandom loves to think of him as like the cool one it's not even the cool one like let's be completely honest fandom has made Re has made serious black into a frat boy yes a that's really it smart good at everything frat boy that is fandom's take on serious they uh, do think he's a frat boy a lot of fics have him as the frat boy yes in fact i was shocked i ran into an asexual serious black what? Uh, fanfic the other day uh when i was trolling for jilly and I was shocked because that is the only of like I have never seen Sirius Black written other than being desperately in love with Remus and completely whoring himself out to everybody who like has a skirt on. Like those are the only Sirius Blacks I have ever read fan fiction about because those are the only Sirius Blacks fandom seems to have. But there was an asexual one and I was like, wow, this makes sense too. <laughs> Well, we get so little evidence of them and uh, uh, so little uh, information about them in canon. Anything could make sense with a talented fic writer, right? Fan okay, okay. I'm going to argue this. Fandom 100% makes him a frat boy. 100%. No, but I see the anarchist take too. But I feel like a fa the most of the fandom stuff that I see, even when you get like anarchist serious black, um, a lot of the fics uh, don't really understand what anarchy is, and so yeah, he he it, he. They will say like he, you know, he's wears things with the anarchist A on it or whatever. But from the perspective of like the frat boy that wears the um, Hugo Chavez shirt, like they don't in fandom like he doesn't understand. But I think that's mostly because the fic writers don't understand what they're saying when they when they you know say he's anarchist, right? Not necessarily because the character wouldn't. And it's, I mean, it's not even necessarily, like, I'm just talking about how the, how, how media presents frat boys view on, like, women and how they're presented. Yeah. They're the hot, attractive, can get anything that they want, can, can be very charming and convincing and, and can, like, attract a lot of women and men. And that is a lot of what, like, serious Black, he's the pretty boy. Yeah. of the group that's how a lot of people do it yes he is very anti-establishment very like fuck you everybody but he's also like the one that's like hey i'm not gonna commit i'm gonna dip right after i get this <laughs> like, like that's, that is tends to be how fandom portrays him yeah uh, and those both can exist within within like the same community because yeah i i don't think fan fandom writers necessarily know anarchy and what true anarchy looks like or being an anarchist looks like uh and also trying to appease the serious black is supposed to be hot sort of thing well they do it's very, he's very hit it and quit it he's very hit it and quit it in fandom very hit it and quit it 
unless it's, it's like, unless it's Wolf Star, then he'll hit it and quit it until he falls in love with Remus, and then then he commits to to Remus. Like that's yeah, pretty like, that's pretty standard. Uh, do I have your consent? Yes, I'm gonna leave in the morning and then not remember your name tomorrow. So <laughs> glad we have consent now, but just don't talk to me tomorrow. Like that's yeah. what Sirius is kind of like. Well, Kay, Kay, to be fair, at the time a lot of these um, fanfics were being written, the political discourse was completely different in the U.S. and in the U.K. So, um, so you can't really you can't really fault people for not understanding certain um, political movements and things like that. Um, you know, in a in a pre-Trump uh, U.K. and and U.S. like in pre-2016, there was just a lot of stuff that people didn't talk about. It just wasn't in the zeitgeist. You just didn't know. You know, especially. Uh, for the age groups that were yeah. really focused on this. Like we're talking, I mean, this is Tumblr era 2012. So really what the majority of the fandom was made of was 12 to 26 year olds, which- Yeah, I mean, there were adults in the fandom. Into, absolutely. But like I'm saying the majority- Yeah, absolutely. Um, of that time period, especially that were engaging on Tumblr, that were engaging in stuff like that, was that was that 15 year span. Um was really not focused politically uh mm -hmm. it wasn't until this most recent generation and most recent like political happenings that have happened that have really gotten the younger people interested in politics yeah at yeah at least here in the united states i can't speak to other countries yeah but i think i think the uk is pretty similar because they've had a similar trajectory with their um with their stuff they had i can't remember his name but they had their trump light uh whatever his name was anyway um thank you so much for the lurk roses we appreciate our lurkers here so yeah um, i think in the fandom a lot of what you get is this very like playboy hit it and quit it version of Sirius that there is absolutely no evidence of in canon like that doesn't exist nowhere do they say that he's a ladies man the best that you get is um is harry's inner monologue about how attractive he thinks that sirius is and how much he assumes the ladies like him um well, and again so we needed that like we like when you're looking at the entirety all together and all, all four of the boys together, you want four different archetypes. And that's yeah. what people are really thirsty for, especially in the fandom area. So you had the nerdy, quiet, genuinely good guy, which was Remus Lupin. You had the idiot who was committed to the first woman he saw that made him have any feelings, which was James. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you had the, the loser, who was Peter Pettigrew, and we'll get into both of those. So the archetype that you're missing is the commitment phobic, hit it and quit it frat boy yeah yep and i do like that serious i mean i i am all for characters embodying tropes i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing and it works really well like a, a well-written uh marauders fanfic that really like plays to all the tropes strongly and and features all four of the characters um heavily you know that doesn't forget about peter we'll get to peter but a lot of fanfic authors like to forget about him um but this doesn't you know that that shows them all uh, and makes their tropes really strong, I think is some of the best Marauders fic that there is. <laughs> I feel like t I do 2K. Uh, I love that so much. <laughs> Dinkleberg. But, uh, yeah, and that, don't get me wrong. I love Playboy Serious Black. It is my absolute favorite trope. Like it is something yeah. that I'm just like, yes, please. Can we have these two best friends? Because it is hierarchy girl in the group for Sirius and James to be best friends. Oh, apparently. absolutely. Uh, and I love the idea of James can't stop thinking about one girl and Sirius just be, can't remember anybody who he Yeah, had. new girlfriend every weekend like, for Sirius. New girlfriend or boyfriend every day. Like, yes. <laughs> just be like, and I love that. I love that mm -hmm. opposite. Uh, but that's my personal trope for BFS. But it's just funny. It's funny to me because like you, it's exactly what you said. You have like the hardcore monogamist um, oh, yeah. you know, uh, James Potter that literally never cared for any other girl ever and then died tragically young. So we never find out if he ever would have. Um, and then we have Sirius Black who can't commit to save his life. <laughs> oh, Sirius. Yeah. Who's also tra They're all tragic. All of yeah. them are tragic. <laughs> it's true. Um, was there any other serious hot takes that we want to talk about that's in f that exist in fandom? There are so many. And like I said, I could talk about this for hours. I think for um, Sirius, I, these are these are the main ones that we see because really, when it comes to Sirius, he gets pulled in to a lot of the fandom drama in in regards to Wolf Star. Like that's where he really gets he gets pulled in. You don't often see much on um, Sirius by himself. You just see Sirius as like part of this nebulous Remus Lupin fandom drama. 
I did want to I did want to mention very quickly of how like just because it is a deep dive onto the character and we didn't mention this how um the effects of Azkaban are shown in the books mm-hmm. as far as like Sirius's inability to be older than 21 even though he's yeah. uh, like physically an adult but because he was in jail and in stuck in such a miserable place miserable bl- miserable place because of dementors he he acts and does not act more mature than the age in which this trauma happened to him yeah um and he you could even say that about like he acts 16 because that's also when trauma happened to him Mm -hmm. and it really is something that is beautiful about the character and something that i personally love that causes a lot of pain to a lot of both fandom members but also canon characters yeah, but I agree. I think I think that's very true. Sirius has a lot of weird interactions with Harry, like we mentioned um, a couple of them in our uh, stream about Prisoner of Azkaban. That's just like, that's not what an adult would say to a kid. Like he literally, um, he, he, he considers Harry as his peer, which is yeah. not what he should be doing, but that is what he does. <laughs> and that's because um, he, he doesn't consider himself he hasn't had any experience in which he is older than 21. Right. Like he really literally hasn't like his whole, his whole life was stunted at the age in which he went into Azkaban, right? Like he survived it and he kept his sanity, but he was not able to grow in there. Like he was in isolation for all those years. So of course, I mean, it's a, it's a miracle that he wasn't more harmed by what he went through in, in Azkaban. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, he does not, he does not grow at all as a person. He is forever 21 and still behaves as, as a 21 year old when, when he eventually, you know, dies in the books. Like he, he never, he never grows older. Yeah. And that is something that is incredibly, incredibly tragic. Uh, yeah. and in its own way. Like that's the other thing too, is that we're talking about all of these tragic characters and there's something beautiful about like again all of them being a different archetype within this friend Mm -hmm. group um and not really necessarily on the surface looking like they have anything in common Mm -hmm. but also at the same time all of their tragedies are individualized as well like there is trauma bonding just gotta make this trauma like it, it trauma bonding absolutely but to the extent of like remus grows up like and lives the life but it's a miserable life james dies way too early sirius is trapped for a, mm-hmm. for a crime he didn't commit and Peter Pettigrew is in hiding living with the guilt that he killed his friends mm-hmm. um and the and that he killed his friends and still didn't win in the end yeah uh which is something we're going to talk about here in a second yeah. but yes just beautiful beautiful just creation of stories I don't even like because she never digs into it so I don't even want to give JK and please don't like please never uh, <laughs> please never do let the marauders be fandom forever please but never make fandom, a canon thing the fandom making all of these connections and and writing these beautiful stories is some of my favorite yeah but I think that's a great segue into Peter himself so let's talk about our favorite rap boy or my favorite rap boy so Peter has a very um, special place in my heart. I find his arc so incredibly tragic. I find the story that he goes through um, so relatable in a sense that like people think they wouldn't do this, but no, this is like the kind of thing that people would would do in these situations. Um, so so here here we here we go. Here's Peter's history. We really don't get a huge amount of um information about his early early life pre Hogwarts. Um we can assume he had a relatively happy life with a relatively happy family, but um but we really aren't told. Like he might have had a really rough home life in the same way that Sirius Sirius did. Um, I, I've seen all sorts of interpretations of what his pre Hogwarts life was like, because we are not told like at all what Peter's life was like beforehand. We do know that he is a half blood simply because, um, Pettigrew never appears on the sacred 28 maps. Yes. Yes. Um, so we do know that he, he has muggle blood within him. So he probably doesn't grow up in the same hierarchical blood extremist 
yeah, as yeah. Sirius does. But yeah, but we, we don't know don't necessarily know personalities. But we don't know which parent was which. We don't know if he lived a mostly Muggle life and and then was brought to Hogwarts, or if he lived a mostly Wizarding life with a with a Muggle parent and then was brought to Hogwarts. Um, we just don't know, and the only reason we can even say that he's half blood is because he does join up with Voldemort, so he must be at least half blood, right? Like he can't be Muggleborn, but he, but Pettigrew is not a a pure blood name, so um, so he must be at least half blood, right? So like maybe he's got um a a, a Muggle father and a, a witch mom or something like that. Like that's that's the best we can we can surmise, right? But what we do know is when he gets to Hogwarts and we know that he is basically the Neville of that time. He really struggles to make friends. He struggles with school. He struggles with um, with fitting in. He's, he's not, you know, he's just not very good at any of the things you might need to be good at to get fulfillment out of school. He's not a good Quidditch player. He's not good in his classes. He's not good at um, interacting with his, his peers. Well, so- and I do even want to argue that because the other thing is, is that we don't know he wasn't good at at uh, at being like in his classes. We just know that he didn't study as much as Remus, mm-hmm. and they made fun of him with having more trouble. Yeah. Um. But he still was a capable wizard. Like he did acts of magic, like Animagi, which is, he still figured out how to become like, an Animagus, right? So he couldn't have sucked that much. And that is extremely like dangerous magic yeah um, and, and he figured it out i'd also assume that he did work on the marauders map because sirius doesn't seem like the type of guy who would let peter put his name on it if he didn't help <laughs> yeah so he must have done something so so, it's, so yeah, it's like that he's just he's constantly compared him less than yeah he is he's considered less than the others you kind of get the sense that this this friend group is inspired from like um, some mean girl friend groups where they kind of have the one friend that they pick on all the time, and and Peter is the the picked on one. Um, so whether he is in reality more or less capable than the others, we don't ever get to know because we never see anything from Peter's perspective. We only get told about Peter from Sirius's and Remus's perspective. Um, and then, of course, we see him interact in some scenes with Voldemort, but that's that's pretty much all that all that we get. So he's he's in Hogwarts with um, with these guys. He is part of the Animagus thing where he um, is going to help Remus. But very interestingly, uh, instead of being a dog or a stag or a wolf or something that you think of this very strong, he becomes a rat. And we don't really ever in Harry Potter get told how you choose your animagus form. So I like to think it's just sort of, it's sort of an, some unchanging part of you is your animagus form. Whatever it, whatever that is, it's some unchanging part of you. So some unchanging part of Peter is very meek and, uh, and prefers to flee. You know, in his fight or flight response, he's very flee and hide and freeze type of response. Well, and also betrayal. Like rats mm-hmm. are have been symbolized as betrayal even before the colloquialism of, of being a rat came around. Yep. Like even though he doesn't commit any betrayal until later in his life. So Yeah. So there is like a setup to and that's why I also don't think it was very thought through. I think they were just like, Oh man, let's think what's an animal that could be could represent betrayal a rat yeah <laughs> all right, right jkr <laughs> yep um, oh that's a good thought Kay. that's really interesting like uh taking the the name of whoever is more magical regardless of the person's gender i don't know maybe i love that hold yeah. on i gotta read the whole comment gotta come gotta go to the twitch um I mean, so here's the deal. Uh, there's a lot of proof that the Wizarding World is still underneath the scheme of patriarchy, which yeah. means that, like, I don't think that that is the thing that is happening. Um, and even if it was, I think inherently the men would be considered more magical just because that's how patriarchy works. Yep. Uh, and so, but I really like that and I wish it was done. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a that's a really interesting idea. I would totally read a fic that was um that played with some of those ideas. But yeah, so um, we've got we've right, got... witchcraft is more matriarchal. However, Harry yeah. Potter is not. It is very patriarchal. No, Harry Potter is a is a very um capitalist 
um, uh, corruption of some of the ideas of witchcraft, which is a whole other episode. We've not we've not really delved into that sort of thing, but um, very much. Okay. But uh, we could, because <laughs> <laughs> um, I have some thoughts about that. But anyway, back to Peter. So we've got this very tragic figure that we really, for his early life, we don't know a lot about because we only ever hear about who he is from people that presently hate him, right? Because he because he betrayed them, because he's the reason that James and Lily died. He's the reason that Harry is in the situation now that he is. Um, and that the story is unfolding the, the way that it is. And so there's a lot of hate for Peter. So even if even if the the Marauders, even if Sirius and Remus were true friends with Peter and loved Peter and cared about Peter, which I do think there's some evidence for that. I'll mention that in a second. It doesn't matter whether they ever felt that way. They don't express it now because they couldn't. What Peter did was too unforgivable, right? But we have to remember, one of the canon facts that we know about Peter and how he was able to commit the betrayal that he did was he was their secret keeper. So that makes me think that they really did truly trust him, that out of all of them, he was the most trustworthy of the group. He was the one that they thought was least likely to go blab, that was the least likely to give away their um, their situation, right? As so they made him secret keeper, and of course that backfired on him. But he must have, he mu their, his behavior up until that point must have been incredibly loyal for them to trust him over any of the rest of themselves. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think he was, like, I think that, the, I think he was a friend. Like, I think that that was, <sighs> that is something that I hate about fandom when they sit there and say that, like, Peter was just always tagging along. He wasn't, um, at least not to James uh, and yeah. Lily. Like, James and Lily wouldn't be like, let's give it to anybody. Like, they didn't even, oh, that was the other thing about Sirius. I want to talk about. Anyway, we'll go back to that. They didn't even want to tell anybody that Sir that uh, Peter Pettigrew was their secret keeper. Yeah, they, that, theory, that secret that secret was with Dumbledore, them, and Peter, mm -hmm. and that's it. Mm -hmm. Um, very quickly, Kay, I just wanted to say this: that uh, the pure blood name I am referring to is yes, like it it could be that, but it, he's not on any of the tapestries that we have seen throughout the Harry Potter series. So there's a chance that he's pure blood, but I think it's but he's think probably it's not. Probably that he's a he's a uh, he's a half blood, if not like half blood after a few generations. But he is not part of the sacred twenty eight. Yeah, um, yeah. He's so he's not. He's probably not part of the um, the sacred the sacred twenty eight. He, he probably he probably isn't. He's probably half blood, or maybe he's quarter blood or something like that. But I don't think that he is that he is pure blood because we would have been told that that would be an important part of his character. I think we would have been told that. Um, yeah. Roses, can you hit me up later for that? I don't want to link it again in in the chat. Um, so so yeah, Peter basically is 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 this character that um that really is serves the plot in his way he's, he's really not fleshed out as a character um he's really there to to show that the choices that were made during the first wizarding war had negative results right people were not focused on the things they should have been focused on which is why Voldemort was not fully defeated and why he was able to come back right like they, that's the whole point of his character but because he's so not fleshed out you can take him in so many different directions um you can do you can do so many things with him and and I, I find a part of Peter that I find fascinating that um the fandom never really writes about because I don't even know like how you could make an interesting story about this, but it's just wonderful brain worms for me to, to spend time thinking about. All that time he lived as a rat in the Weasley's house and he just lived and lived and lived for like years, way longer than a rat could live, looking disheveled and old the whole time because of his the guilt that he was racked with um, and not because he was an old rat. And, and I just think that's so funny. I just imagine like all of this weird arguments and things that he overheard at the Weasley's house, all of the, the things he got to witness them, you know, playing together and, and having meals together and things like that. And what he must have thought watching the Weasleys interact in such a huge family unit. Yeah. I'm like, it's just, it's a very long time. And also as like a rat, I am of the belief that you probably don't have the same brain capability when you're in an I guess, fine form. Maybe, um, I don't know. That would make him miserable to be <laughs> a rat, unable to communicate or conversate with people. Like he'd go insane. Um, but maybe he is. But I think that that would be, that is a really interesting uh, take that no one really talks about. 
Yeah. Well, he does uh, go back again, to Voldemort, so maybe he is a little bit insane from living so long as a rat. Who knows? Yeah. Or he just want like he like that's the thing is that Peter is chasing people who love him, and will protect him. Yeah. Uh, and then that like dives into he probably doesn't feel protected by people very often. So who does he think he's going to win? Um, and that seems to be all logic goes to it being Voldemort. Like yeah. maybe not in the first war, but in the second war, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, well, because you think like, oh, he learned from his mistakes. He's going to win this time. Why wouldn't he? And he's immortal. Like he, this yeah. man literally came back from the death. Um, so I think that that's that's a really interesting take on him. Yeah. Um, as far as fandom goes with him, I something that that has happened is that fandom has made him ugly and fat. Yeah. Uh, and and even though he he is described as rat like, but so is Draco like in the yes, yeah, so is Draco. <laughs> and but, we think he's hot, <laughs> but I mean like rat like looking. But that's specifically when he's older, after he has yeah. been a rat for over a decade. Yeah. Um, that he that that is that is the way that he looks. But people have made him fat. People like even him as a kid, even though that that's not what's described. Um, people have yeah we never we never hear anything about his weight we don't know they've made him feel like a loot like that he's the loser that no one likes him at Hogwarts um and and that might be true but that all feeds into why he would find people who did like him Mm -hmm. why he would be a vulnerable person to be manipulated yeah which is what Um, what happens to him of course he gets manipulated and pulled into Voldemort's cult I never understood what people saw. Okay, why would you even say such a thing to Landon? <laughs> Blonde and rich. There we go. That's the secret formula. But yeah, so when I think of when I think of Peter, when I think of Peter, I think of him as like the most malleable of the of the Marauders, which is probably why I'm drawn to him because I can play with him the most. Whereas the other characters, you get a lot more of in canon because we get so much less with Peter. I'm just like, ooh, ooh, more to mess with. More more interpretations we could have that are that are totally valid. I. I think I appreciate as I've gotten older I've appreciated his character more I still hate mm-hmm. him well you know <laughs> he does do some bad things I hate him serious I'm not attracted to serious at all so that's fine you can have serious <laughs> serious is way more attractive you know Kay I have to agree with you but Landon and I um have a little bit different um taste in in that I'd regard also like to, I'd also like to point out that I am not attracted to men <laughs> Oh, that also does that's like, true that's, that's true. true it's pretty it's pretty rare it's pretty rare that you find a man you're truly interested in here's and most the, of the time they're fictional and here's the thing i'm pretty sure it's just because 12 year old me thought draco was the shit so now i have to i have to die with this i have to die with this opinion because i am that stubborn <laughs> <laughs> But so, so, so when I think when I think of Peter, I think of like how it's it's interesting that uh, that he was also trapped in his adult life the way that Sirius was, and and so he was also not able to move past being twenty one. Uh, just for you know, he's trapped in a little bit of a different way, but it's it, it it comes out very similar. You know, the first thing he does after he escapes is he runs right back to Voldemort. Right, he runs right back to exactly what he was doing at age twenty one. Um, kind of similar to how how Sirius does in the way that he treats Harry just like he would have James because he's right back where he was at 21 and Peter does the same thing um, and then I think it's it's showing you know his his imprisonment is self-imposed like Peter did not have to go into hiding being a rat this long there were plenty of other people that were that had aided Voldemort and would have been and were caught and and still didn't suffer consequences Peter could have leaned on Lucius and um and some of those strategies to try oh, to not I be convicted but class. he did not but he could have tried he didn't know at the time whether he that would have been successful or not he so he didn't been. know <laughs> well, whether it would have been successful or not, he didn't know, but he chooses the thing, he chooses the, the safest thing, even though it's going to be incredibly detrimental on his health and well-being and uh, and his mental health, which it is, obviously. Um, and he, he chooses that even while seeing that other witches and wizards that were involved are getting off scot-free, because you know he's still getting the news because Molly listens to the radio, so he knows that there's plenty of ex-Voldemort followers that are just, you know, living their lives. Well, and he also knows because he goes missing when Sirius Black escapes. Yeah. So he's not clueless. He, yeah. He disappears. He fakes his own death again. Yeah. 
uh, he pretends that that Crookshank like kills him. Yeah. Uh, so that Ron, so that he can escape, he can escape Ron because he knows that Sirius is coming after him. Yeah, because now the one person that could give the, give his game away could pretend, it could do it now, and he's scared. He's he gets too scared of like just the one person. Yeah. So yeah. it's. It's a whole thing. I think I think he is not given enough credit in fandom. He's uh, not. And the depth of his character. Um, it's very, it's, I always find it very interesting how people view morally gray characters such as Peter Pettigrew versus like just evil characters. Because like, there's this love for, intense love for villains, for yeah. evil characters. And there is, of course, this intense love for the heroes, but for those morally gray, real kind of people that make those choices that are inherently selfish, but aren't the big bad, uh, people hate them and, yeah. and, and will not do anything. Like, we'll just like completely destroy them. Well, and uh, I think with, with Peter, when it comes to the fandom, most of the fandom, what they do is they just pretend he's not there. Like, there's like this this funny joke um, on Tumblr. I don't know if it's still getting passed around, but it had a ton of notes when I was last on Tumblr that was like, you know, the Marauders are Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs. The Marauders are not Mooney, Padfoot, Prongs, and um, J and uh, Lily Evans as um, as Karen Gillian, because that's the FC we all had for her back then. Uh, because that's what the fandom would do. They would just have Remus, Sirius, James, and Lily. Yeah. Like, as that was the group, but, like, they would just, just forget about Peter. Like, he just and wasn't there. In that, what I think that does is also does a disservice for the amount of trauma that, that went through, like, that Sirius had to live through. Like, Sirius, who is incredibly loyal like like that is his that is his go-to is that he found his people and he will kill for his people which is why it was believable that he would kill or like why it was always unbelievable he was actually working for Voldemort but that's a whole other thing um and he he like he was then betrayed and so was Remus was betrayed and like this whole like the 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 thing is is that peter was important and forgetting yeah. that peter was important is a disservice to the other characters mm -hmm. but that's what fandom does so when you ask me what are what are the my favorite fan uh P peter pettigrew fandom takes none all my favorite peter pettigrew takes are are in in my mind and shared between my friends because the fandom just likes to forget about peter <laughs> so yeah but you know who the fandom doesn't forget about James. <laughs> Jimmy P. Can we talk Jimmy, about P. Jimmy P. Yes. Okay. So this is the moment Landon has been waiting for. So take it away, Landon. Teach us all about James Potter. All right. I'll stick to Canon. Okay. Well, uh, Canon first, then we can talk about fandom. Then we can talk about Jimmy. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, then we should use his proper name. James Potter uh, was born in a pureblood family, in a very rich pureblood family, to two older wizards. They, uh, were in their like like late 40s when they had him uh so they were very they were very much older he is the only surviving son of the potter family uh his father fleamont is famous for his hair care potions um and therefore there is not only ancestral money of being pure blood but also many 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 monies that come with uh being a famous potioner he mm -hmm. uh, had a very supposedly happy childhood with a family that loved him very much. He went to Hogwarts and met a group of friends that he loved and he considered himself the leader of, even if he wasn't. Um, <laughs> and then he met Lily Evans and everything changed and the boy became obsessed Uh and in Hogwarts, he was the chaser, I believe is what the official thing is. Although I think that was said post, like editorialized, it was never defined. I think it was seeker at first and then it was changed to chaser or something like that. I, I, I can't remember, but he I know that it's murky. Star. It's murky. He was yeah, he was a star, star player. Quidditch. He was a star Quidditch player. So whether that be chaser because he scored all the goals or that be seeker because he caught the snitch, who fucking cares? Uh he was a he was very popular in school uh he was very smart teachers liked him 
Uh, he tended to be the person who like was able to rein in Sirius's craziness and also be mm-hmm. charming enough to get Remus on his side. And so he was like the magnanimous person that everybody loved. Uh, and that was how he went through Hogwarts. And he was, you know, side by side with Sirius in every single prank, but also was willing to study hard like Remus was naturally gifted and smart. Uh, he, he was just he was just a very good boy. The perfect boy. <laughs> um, yes. Oh, that's the other thing, too. Uh, he very growing up part of his history is very specific that he was raised by non-racist purebloods which i hate because that would not happen in society uh but that's fine that was how he was presented no but see but in my mind in my mind like it's not that they weren't racist they were racist in the way that like liberals are racist right so so in my mind james's parents were the kind of like you know, I would have voted for Obama a third time if I could have. Like, the get out people, that's James's parents, in my mind. Now, that's not in canon. In canon, they're, non, they're non-racist, they're but we know that J.K. Rowling doesn't know what being not a bigot is like. So, you know. So, in canon, he, you know, the, the Potters were, were gladly blood traitors. Um, although, I personally hate that. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but we're blood traders and we're very supportive of Muggle and all of that and gave money to all of that. Uh, mm-hmm. So the cool liberal parents, right? The really cool, rich liberal parents. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he grew up, he was totally fine with all of this. Again, obsessed with Jilly, but also okay with being like the big damn hero. We actually, we were having a conversation of this. He wants to be the hero. So like he'll step in and he'll bully Severus Snape in order to like under the guise of protecting lily evans yeah. or protecting other people he he has a morally good version of himself and is painted as morally good because he is doing what he thinks is best yeah he's trying his best he is trying his best um he's also an idiot love him <laughs> <laughs> well i also i also think that it's it's implied that he was kind of the one that brought all of the marauders together yes. right like he was the one that was like he was the one that was like that sat down with with them and and like made them all into a friend group absolutely he is the glue that brings them all together mm-hmm. um and and that is just who he is i think everyone kind of knows a james potter in their life at some point it is that charismatic person who just seems to have everything going for them and gets yeah. everything they want because they are able to do that he's like very he's like um, a very always land on his feet like no matter what kind of bad thing happens to james it just works out it's fine he's the golden retriever gamer boyfriend like yes. if serious black is the frat boy he's the golden retriever gamer like, yes like that's just who he is um, and so what that takes us to is, uh, in the seventh year, he and Lily actually develop feelings for each other. He grows more responsible for whatever magical reason. And Dumbledore makes him head boy. So not only was he star of the Quidditch team, but he was also head boy, uh, to yeah. Lily's head girl. They fall in love. They graduate Hogwarts. They join the Order they get- of the Phoenix. They get married. They have Harry Potter and they die tragically, uh, a year later. Yeah. Okay, I'm uh, sorry you think that James is boring. I used to think James was the most boring marauder too, but then in the RP I was in, um, Landon wrote James Potter, and I changed my mind. I fell in love. And I, in my mind, Landon's version of James is canon. <laughs> this man cries at Bohemian Rhapsody. Like, he just hears a Queen song and he starts sobbing. Uh, he's yeah. just like, it's so beautiful! He's a nerd. Uh, but that's fine. Not, not in canon. So... Uh, that is what I have to say about Canon JP. Yeah. Uh, it's just a, he's, he is like Prince Charming. He is written to be Prince Charming. Um, like he's the kind of sports fan that like, he's really into the sports, but for the purpose of his fantasy league, yes. you know, that's like, that's Jimmy. That's Jimmy. Um, yeah. and, or James, we can't say Jimmy. He doesn't go by Jimmy and Canon. But I like uh, it. I like saying Jimmy P. So much. <laughs> uh, yeah. So he's he is doing his best, and I think like it's even funny how like this whole this whole thing. Harry has this whole thing where he's like, "My God, my dad was a bad guy." But like the scene that he's seeing James being a bad guy is like serious calling 
literally a slur so like even like being able to stand outside of that scene where like was he the most mature person in this scenario absolutely fucking not yeah However, but he reacted because he saw he saw severus call his the the girl that he liked to slur and the truth is is that you know stepping in when something like that happens even if you step in you know violently and, and dramatically that's still a, a preferred response than to do nothing and to do nothing and that was like the whole thing right that's the whole thing is james does something he reacts uh, but he doesn't react the way that Sirius reacts, which is going to be not thinking it through. So he is like that meld of just like, like canon, I 100% believe, I believe you want to think James is perfect. Like that is just how he's written. Yeah. Well, because um, Harry has to think he's perfect to go on the character yes. arc that he has to go on. So that's the James that we're that we're led to believe that he's like this perfect this perfect boy, um, who did everything right. He's got the best traits from Remus, Sirius, and and Peter all in one person. And he is the re and he is the person worthy of, of like people fighting for and and wanting to keep like their their his son safe. Yeah. Um, and that's like his whole purpose is that he has to be someone that his sacrifice means something. Because mm -hmm. um, everybody and, wants to follow yeah. James. And when James isn't there, there's no one to follow anymore. And it all kind of falls apart. As you see. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, just undyingly loyal to the redheaded girl he met at 12 years of age. It's um, very cute. It's very unrealistic, but it's very cute. Very cute. The cutest. <laughs> <sighs> so... so so James, uh, James and the fandom. So, so tell tell us a little bit about your ideas of James and the fandom because I really never got into fandom James. I was more like interested in in the other Marauders. So James was always kind of like there for me. It was fine. I was okay with whatever interpretation until, of course, I met your version of James, which I absolutely fell in love with and thought he was the coolest thing ever. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us about a little bit about your perspective on fandom so, James. I think the thing about fandom James is that like he is a nerd above all things and it's not like the traditional nerd of like books and stuff like that but it is the nerd on like he could tell you the history of rock and roll like he could tell you in depth like the history of queen and how they became together and how uh i don't even remember the name uh what's his name freddie mercury yeah, Freddie Mercury. Uh, how Freddie Mercury came up with Bohemian Rhapsody. And like, just, you can see that in his, in his passion in the books, but like, also, that's part of what connects him to both Sirius of like, being able to connect on that level of liking modern muggle things, and Remus and being able to be like, obsessive about the small things. Mm -hmm. um, and he so the thing is too is that part of why I love my James is because there isn't a lot of fandom James out there he is boring he's Captain America of of the um of the Harry Potter universe right yeah which at first glance it sounds it sounds like super boring until you like kind of think about it and delve into it a little bit and yeah. it's like oh there's actually some really good stuff here and the most interesting thing about him is that he is in love with a girl who tells him no and mm -hmm. thinks that he's terrible until mm -hmm. he is no longer terrible like that's his story arc he's no longer yeah. terrible and he has he to grow up so that the um, girl likes him <laughs> yes and so like what i love about james is that that okay we meet this very young immature james and then we meet this james that is so vital to the organization of the order of the phoenix that voldemort himself has to kill him Mm -hmm. and there has to be reason for that change yeah. uh and and it's never talked about in the books and even in fandom it, it there's different reasons um but that like being willing to to die for a cause to being able to put yourself completely and utterly out there um no matter what is something that both harry and james have in common that i really appreciate and that we get to see a little and that in my fandom version of james we get to see a little bit more of 
And I think what really, what really drew me to your version of James that really rings true for me as to what ends up happening in canon, where everyone is, everyone is drawn to him, right? Like he is the leader, Mm -hmm. he is the vital linchpin. And, and something that came through um, in, in your version of James was that he, James knows exactly who he is and he is not interested in compromising on that. And if you are, if you, 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 you should, James's attitude is everyone needs to lead, follow, or get out of the way because I, I, this is what I'm doing. This is, this is my life and this is how I'm going to live it. And you can be a part of it or you cannot be a part of it. And I think that that is in an incredible, um, insight into his character and really fits in the whole idea of like James is the one that everybody wants to follow because I yeah. think that's what makes that's what makes uh, him compelling and somebody that you are interested in taking orders from and, and interested in what their plans are and going along with their plans and things like that is is somebody that is so confident and so sure of themselves and can explain to you exactly why he's going to do what he's going to do. Oh yeah. And just convinced totally and completely that he is right. And yeah. then when he learns that he is not right, completely okay with accepting that. Yeah. Um, and yeah. He's like, okay, well this is right now. So let's make a new plan. Awesome. Cool. New plan. And it is that idea of lead, follow, get out of the way. Yeah. Uh, and it is that idea of this is what we have. So suck it up and deal buttercup. Um, and, and the willingness to just give everything because I think that that's the thing is that we always talk about Lily's sacrifice but James sacrificed everything first Mm -hmm. uh he was the person who is like go get Harry and run I will fight death on our doorstep Mm -hmm. uh even if I don't have my wand and you need to go and I will sacrifice myself for you guys and he is that person and I feel like has always been that person um he's always like the person who has the boisterous attitude uh, when he's when he's the one like dealing with Snape and like willing to willing to challenge Snape, knowing that challenging Snape might also mean bringing the other Slytherins to like challenge him mm-hmm. and, or detention uh, at at the least, you know, at least you know having to spend an, an afternoon in detention and yeah, you know having to absolutely. get scolded and 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 weighing those like okay, this is the consequence to my action. Well, it is more important that I stand up at, against this racist bigot than spending a, like I can spend a, a night in detention that's fine yeah. um or like even like when Sirius draws Snape into uh into Remus to kill him when okay so uh for context if you guys don't remember um Severus Snape might discover that Remus Lupin is a werewolf so Sirius tricks him into going down to the uh Shrieking Shack and yeah. James sacrifices, like puts himself in Remus trying to attack a human's way and puts his life on the line to save Sirius Black, or not Sirius Black, to save Severus Snape, who's been nothing but unkind and evil towards him and the person that he loves. Mm -hmm. uh, And is like, this is not right. And that shows the difference there. Like that's, that's. Well, because, because he knows regardless, like Snape doesn't, doesn't necessarily always have to feel that way. He could change and grow. So he does not Mm -hmm. deserve, you know, he doesn't deserve necessarily that such a severe punishment for his, for his bigotry at that time. And he also knows that Remus wouldn't have wanted to do that, that Remus would have (laughs) felt so guilty for doing that. And he's not going to let Remus make that type of mistake. Yeah. So again, it's that sort of leader mentality of, of like rating in serious and sitting there and being like, this is not a pro, this is the level of inappropriate this is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I love, I, I agree that in the books, J- James is one of the more boring characters because we don't know anything about him. He's dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, but. And no one wants to tell Harry the truth because they love that he has this idle version of James in his head. That's perfect. And that's what he needs in order yeah. to do everything like sacrifice himself. Um, but I just love my queen obsessed, puddle mirror loving, or wannabe James Potter. <laughs> just I love him because I can talk about him forever. I love that. Yeah. Uh, and he will forever be known as Jimmy P in my mind because you cannot tell me that in the 70s he was going by James Potter. He's like going he by Jimmy wasn't. P. He my wasn't. other favorite, 
My other favorite part of your your James is that you like to have um, Alistair Moody being oh, yeah. his being his boss and his mentor in the workplace. And mm-hmm. uh, and I and I wish in canon we heard a little bit more from Alistair about how he felt about each of the Marauders. We don't get enough of that. We get little glimpses of it in later books where um, Alistair talks a little bit to Harry about some of that stuff. But uh, but I want more. I want more because I love that dynamic. <laughs> Well, and it's just, again, it's wanting more about the Marauders. I would, Mm -hmm. I, man, I do not want her to make any more stuff. I don't want her to write anything more about the Harry Potter, but my God, if I thought it could be done right and done well, and she had nothing to do with it, I would love an HBO series on the Marauders. Me too. Whether it be like from (laughs) here to, to James and Lily's death, man, that would be, that would make, I would never need a Christmas or birthday present again. I would be happy for that. Um, if you oh, could be, be right, not transphobic, and uh, not piss off most of most of the fandom, which is all impossible. Yeah, but, I don't. I don't think all of that's possible. I think we'll have to just stick to fanfics for them, which is why I don't want anyone to touch it. But I, I agree with you. If somebody with a true fan passion that understood why Harry Potter still has elements that resonate with people, despite how flawed the series is and how flawed its creator is, if they, they could understand like those little nuggets, if they could be in charge, like this, this, that type of person be in charge. Oh my God, how good would it be? Would love it. Would love yeah. it so much. So basically what this huge monologue is, is please write Lily with me or, <laughs> or if you RP at any shape or form, I'm, I would love to RP with your Remus or your Sirius or anyone. I, I will pick up my Jimmy P pen any day of the week. So we don't have a slide for we don't have a slide for Lily, but no, I would love since we ha- still have a few more minutes before we have to to do the final segment. Um, what do you have like some fandom Lily takes that uh, that you'd like to share with everybody? Since you're such a huge Jilly fan, um, so many different kinds of Lilies. I think the thing about Lily uh, is that she she stands up for her for what is right um, morally. And that she, again, matches, almost matches James to that level of being able to sit there and say, this is what's right and this is what's wrong and we're going to do it. And I think she takes, I like to think of her as like a halfway point between Molly Weasley and Ginny Weasley, Mm -hmm. um, where she has like the maternal, the maternal instinct of Molly, but has like the spite and or the spitfire personality of Ginny. Mm-hmm. Uh, that she just is kind of like this this person who's like nope we're gonna do this uh, and I also think her being w- what I think one of the things that I love the most is that she is of the Marauders the only I know that she's not included but of that group including the other like side character that are women she's the only muggle-born yeah she's the only person who is truly truly being affected and or not affected but victimized um by what is being spread by Voldemort's like rhetoric Mm -hmm. that she is the one personally being attacked and whose life is in danger and and knowing that people hate her for just existing Mm -hmm. uh and I think that that connects her to like that makes her someone that they rally against but also someone who like doesn't succumb to that that sits there and goes no we have to fight this Mm -hmm. uh and i love that i do like that that is something interesting about the golden the golden trio era versus the marauders era um we don't know a lot of the blood statuses of the characters in the marauders era but we do know their surnames so we can make some guesses and lily is the only one that we can be confident is truly muggle-born that is not pure blood or half blood yeah because i think i think yeah, I think Vance might be the only one that is really in question. Yeah. Uh, but everyone else has family members that are either mentioned or their blood status is mentioned at some point. Right. Yep. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Roses. Thank you know, you don't have to do that, but I really, really appreciate it. I love you guys so much. I really do. Um, so yeah, Lily Lily is a character that I think is, is really fun. And I always was, um, as far as the Jilly piece of it goes, I was always more attracted to Lily than James. Even though character-wise, a lot of times they're written very similarly. Um, I think I just like those traits in a girl better than I like them in a, in a guy. That's just how that is. <laughs> totally. Listen, 
don't get me wrong I'm pretty sure Jimmy P is the only one that I'm like ah this is this is fine and any if it wasn't him it would be any female character that I prefer it in for Um, sure but hey if you're gonna if you're gonna get Jilly someone has to write James and I understand the pull like if maybe if you really want to write like I I mean I've I've had ships like this before where I want to role play them and one of the characters is way more popular than the other as far as finding a willing partner and so I'll just write the other one and that's and then that's just how that goes you know (laughs) I'm like trying to think how I even started writing I think I knew it was in um low l-o-o-h but I think I wanted to start writing James yeah, no, you just said you wanted be... James because we were just talking about who should play each of the main marauders and you, you just said, I want James. And like, that was all I there was it... to it. Yeah, I also think because out of the, like the three or four of us that were in there, no one actually wanted to play one of the main four. Yeah, and so we had to have some of them represented. <laughs> probably have somebody who's doing yeah. that. Uh, and so you were like, well, I'll play James. I want him. I was like, and we okay. said, okay. <laughs> I can do that better than Sirius or Remus. Um, and I did. I did awesome. Yeah. So James, your James was awesome. I love. Do we want to so talk? Much. I know we only have like ten minutes. Do Do we really quickly want to talk about um, d- talk about Snape? Yeah. So super quick, I do have some things on Snape. Um. So so I Snape is one of the characters we could actually talk a lot about, but we this was focused on the Marauder. So of course he was the the last possible one. So we figured we talk about him for the time because I have a lot of hot takes about Snape. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's a if it's a episode of the future. Yeah, so so a couple of things that are that are fun about the fandom for Snape. I'm just going to give you guys little nuggets that you can Google because we really don't have time have time to go into it. But if you're if you're curious, you should Google Snape wives. Absolutely fascinating fandom thing that right. happened around Severus Snape. Um, so so that's the gift that that I give you in these last couple of minutes because I don't really have time to go into all of my Severus Snape takes. But yeah, Snape wives, Google that. Have fun this afternoon. You're welcome. Uh, Snape Wives is uh, um, Have you guys talked about the curse surrounding the DIDA position yet? No, but I'm sure that is something we will get to. That'll um, be, Lunar, I, yes. That'll be a sixth so, book thing since that actually happens in the sixth book. Yeah, we will get to that. Um, so for Lunar, what Lunar's referring to, for those of y'all that don't know, we like to do a personality quiz at the beginning of my Thursday streams, and we did which Marauders character are you, and Lunar got Snape, although the um, the description for Snape was was very kind and uh, and loving, and I actually think it did fit you, Lunar. I'm so sorry. Um, but uh, the the descriptions that they have for theirs are, are very nice. Um, like they have a Peter description that's really good. Uh, anyway, it was, a, it was a good quiz that we took. No, it wasn't BuzzFeed. It was you quiz. It was a you quiz. Thank you so much for the applause, Jane. We appreciate it. Okay. So <laughs> wait, no, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so okay so we, we we don't have too much time to go into Snape but you know we always have a character that we pull out and talk about for each of the books you know we've done Hermione we've done Hagrid we've done um all the we we've done the Weasley siblings um as a whole so I'm sure that at some point Snape will be a character focus yeah he's I mean we can't leave the last book with where it's at without talking about Snape so for real I'm sure that'll be that'll show itself in um either the seventh or the sixth one. Yeah, we'll see how we'll see how it goes when we get there. Um, but that thing being said, I do think, Landon, it is time for our good news article. Oh, you've already linked it. Fabulous. Okay, so here's we were same braining there. Let me pull I, that up for us. I did this um, because a fun fact about Landon is that I'm scared of sheep. So I saw this and I was like, we're going to overcome our fear of sheep and <laughs> enjoy a little sheep news. <laughs> Watch sheep fill the streets of Madrid on annual migration of shepherds. Okay, so, so what's going on here? So basically in Spain, as the water changes, they bring uh, sheep from one side of the country to the other. Like it's a, that was like traditionally what happened. Um, so now it has become a, it has become a like thing that oh happens, God. especially in Madrid, uh, where like, people and shepherds bring their sheep to basically just walk through the city in a parade sort of fashion to represent the migration of like farmers during the uh like during the old time eras did you see some of them had little bells around their necks how cute (laughs) and of course like everyone dresses up these days in like old traditional farmer and shepherd flock uh and and just like basically have a day of 
where sheep are just paraded through the entirety of a modern city. Oh my gosh. Uh, and it's it's hysterical. Okay. So I like um I I just want to pull a quick aside here. I have a very special message for Mr. James. So Mr. Jane, uh sorry, Mr. Jane. Mr. Jane, are you listening? I wanted to wish you good luck on Galactic Legend Luke. So Mr. Jane, good luck on Galactic Legend Luke. Luke, I hope you get him. Okay, we can go back to talking good luck. about sheep now. You're going to kill it. Kick it. <laughs> I don't know. Good luck. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so the, we basically what you're saying, Landon, is we need to take you here during these um, during the sheep migrations so that uh, we can get you some good uh, immersion therapies. So you can get over your fear of sheep. No. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to share with everybody the story of why you're so scared of sheep? Because I think it's here's a funny like, story. I will. Sh I here's I will make this deal. You ready for this? This I'm ready. Karen doesn't want, but I'm going to give it to her. Okay. The day that Karen does her first dice making tutorial stream, Motherfucker. I will t pop online and I will tell the story of why I'm afraid of sheep and just know that it is hilarious <sighs> and fucking worth it. So making dice for those that don't know is a multi-day process. So it's very unlikely that I will stream uh, dice making it's probably gonna have to be a youtube oh, video of okay, content then just pouring dice or something or okay. whatever if you're if you're gonna do some craft stream thing i will do it then but it should i hate be you so much i hate okay. you okay <laughs> it's you can tell the people that it's worth it garrett it is worth it it's a really funny story that's why i wanted you to tell it god landon <laughs> <laughs> He hates it. Oh, I'm glad Mr. Jane liked his uh, his good luck. Um. <laughs> we love you, Mr. Jane. <laughs> thank you for the applause, and thank you for the applause also, um, Jane and Lunar, and thank you for the wow, Jed. As you guys know, those applauses um, go straight <gasps> into Landon's um, vial of life so she can live another week. She cannot do it without your applause. Uh, don't forget before the stream ends to please contribute to the uh, community challenge for finishing Doki Doki Literature Club. If you have not spent your 2,000 or 4,000 or whatever it is, um, channel points, go ahead and do that because we are gonna be ending in a few minutes. Uh, all of that being said, Landon, let's do the outro. Um, where can everybody find you? Um, you can't find me on TikTok, wow! you can find me, so where you can find me is on Instagram and on Twitter, Land in Maine. Uh, that's been fun the last few weeks. I'm uh, so sorry you had to get rid of your TikTok. It, it does suck, but, you know, it's it, it happens. I understand that I'm very popular to 11-year-old children, and I don't need to, them to have access to my life. 11-year-olds so. shouldn't even be on TikTok. It's just, like, such a ridiculous thing, but, you know. It's fine. Uh, but you can find me on Twitter. I posted a pretty picture of myself on there uh, earlier yesterday. And you can find me on Instagram at Land in Maine. And maybe one day in the future, I'll have something more to advertise. We'll see. Putting yeah. out that out into the universe. Yeah. Uh, Karen, where can they find you? Okay, so I do the same things that everybody else does as far as um, supporting me. Here's all my socials. You can follow me on um, on YouTube. You can follow me on Twitter, and you can follow me, of course, on Twitch. And um, you can, if you want to help the show, you can subscribe or give bits here through um, through the the show through. Uh, the, through Twitch. Um, but not today. Please donate to the Trevor Project today. But um, just show up on Thursday. That's our next stream, which we are going to be doing Final Fantasy, uh, no, Final Fantasy X. We will finally be getting Waka's Celestial Weapon, and that will complete all the Celestial Weapons. And then we're going to go on to beat Sin after that. Um, so that's all the stuff that you can find me. Kay, just so that the story has context, Landon, her day job is a school teacher. So when she says 11-year-olds yeah. found her, she means like literally her students that she teaches who are too young to have a TikTok found her TikTok and they proceeded to like, actually, yeah, they proceeded to tell her that they found her TikTok. So like, we'll see you on she had Monday. to get rid of it. And I was like, I hate all of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, dumb brats. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, you know... They, and an 11 year old shouldn't be watching this either. If you're 11 watching this, just know my content is not for kids. So it's and not intended of, for you. And if you're one of my students, you have a book report to write. So you better be writing it right now. That's right. Not listening to us <laughs> ramble about Harry Potter. <laughs> All right, you guys, let's find somebody to raid. Let's find somebody to raid. Who's, who is live on this beautiful a, Sunday? I have a person if you do not. Um, I, ha I have some people, but who's your person? Cool. We can raid your person. Uh, Pugzoomies. Oh, yeah, I see them. 
Um, we can raid. We can raid Pugzumis. No problem. They are playing Among Us. Ooh. Oh, before um, while I'm kind of getting this raid going, Landon, tell everybody what we're going to be talking about on Interstage Window next Saturday. Uh, you'll, we're talking about Cowboy Bebop. <laughs> <laughs> Cowboy Bebop, come watch, come watch. We're going to deep dive into the uh, themes and trepidations of the uh, cowboy Western anime of Cowboy yeah. Bebop. And it's wonderful um, soundtrack. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. So, so be there on Saturday. We're going to, um, we're going to be talking about Cowboy Bebop. Uh, you can find it on Netflix. Netflix added it recently since the live action is going to be there. You can watch the actual anime version on, um, on Netflix if you would like to watch it before the stream. But yeah, we'll be talking about that on Saturday. All right, guys, let's raid into Pug Zoomies. Okay. Y'all have, um, y'all have a good day. Of course, uh, don't forget as always to make it a great day. And don't forget to be awesome. Bye. Right. Bye guys. <laughs>